because I didn't have a lot of background in music, I wasn't constrained by the laws of making music. A light bulb just went off in everybody's head. Man, they went crazy, like bananas. I mean, I thought like, oh, it's a ball. Wow, that was quick. That was quick. Let's see if it's as good as it used to be. My first drum machine, I don't know if it counts, but as a drum machine, but it was a Casio. The little the Casio, Casio tone? Or the one that goes doop, doop, oh, doop, 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 <laughs> That's the only beat it did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, let me get a Dr. Rhythm. That was the next one. I just awesome. kept graduating, graduating. Then I borrowed Jesse's drum machine sometimes. I used Jesse's 808 on the whole Jack tracks. Oh, OK. Did you know Vince had loaned that to me? No, I had no idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is this the first time hearing of that? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, my 808 created some of the best records to come out of Chicago, That's so true. I'm good with that. There you go. Your 808 was at the beginning of house music. So seeing me make a record like On and On, other DJs saw that they could do the same thing or better. Everybody in the city knew Jesse as a DJ. A light bulb just went off in everybody's head. Hey, I'm a DJ. I can make records too. Another thing, it wasn't the most polished production in the world. I could do like that. I could do something like that and make a record. So, bang. When I got into it, I wasn't trying to be an artist, per se. I was just trying to add on to my competitive advantage as a DJ. Time to jack. Tap, 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 time to jack. Tap, 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 time to jack. Time to Jack was the first song that time actually put that word jack time into a record. Time to jack. Jacking is kind of like holding on to something, someone, or the wall, wall and just like doing speaker. this. If you were at any other party and you saw somebody doing that dance, you knew what was up. You all automatically had a connection because you knew where they went, where they partied at. Because I didn't have a lot of background in music, I wasn't constrained by the laws of making music. The true root of house music will always be the technology that you use to create it. A lot of people talk about how minimalist early drum machines were, but to us, it was the best we could afford. So we didn't think about it as minimal. To us, it was maximum. We didn't let money stop us. We had to go to secondhand shops just to get music equipment. We couldn't pay to go to studios. But we weren't going to let the fact that we couldn't get in a recording studio keep us from getting music out there. Time to Jack. Tracks Records came about when Larry Sherman, who ran the pressing plant, he saw all these tracks that we were releasing. And so he said, we should start a label. Larry just really kind of took things over. And the only real place to bring your track was to Larry, because he'd sign anything and anybody. It was all about get what you can get right now. So we will make tracks quick and sell them real quick. Tracks is, is very controversial. There's no doubt about that. Because yeah, a lot of stuff went on. People complain about the early tracks records because they had the snap, crackle, and pop. Larry Sherman would buy these skids of vinyl records. I think they'd get them for about two cents a piece. And there was a guy that would take these vinyl records and had a sledgehammer and would take a hammer, put it over a barrel, and knock out the middle of the records. And then they put them in the grinder. They would melt them down. And you know, into the little. And make new records. I remember some of the copies that we would get here at the club. We'd look and go, oh, this is one of the good ones, <laughs> or this is one of the bad ones. I didn't care how they were making the records. I thought my music was going to be so good that people wouldn't care what it was pressed on. I worked the graveyard shift at the post office. 
the hours were 12 midnight to 8.30 a.m. So that's party hours are out of the question. I DJ mostly in my basement. Nobody knew me. We recorded Move Your Body on a Roland 707 drum machine, a Roland JX8P keyboard, and a Prophet 2000 keyboard. And that was it. I was going for Elton John's vibe because Elton John sounded like he was a piano player from church back in the day. I mean, he would jam. I played it like 40 beats per minute and I sped it up. When I played it back, it was playing at 120. It was really cool how, you know, it would sound natural. After a period of time, someone began to do something a little more musical. And I point to Marshall Jefferson. As it was, horrible songwriting in house music. You know, horrible. You got DJs doing it, and they don't know anything about crescendos or building or anything. People say, oh, where's that piano come from? That's not house music. It is now. And you went on the dance floor, people were like in frenzy over this music. There used to be a giant armory in, at the end of Lakeshore Drive downtown, and we would pack that place. An armory would be packed with house heads. I see all these figures, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, all sweating, all smiling, all dancing, all enjoying. This is where I want to be. This is what I, what I want to be a part of. I tried to up my game. I want to try to up my production skills with each record. I more or less left the beginning formats behind and, you know, I was able to expand the genre. No, no, I'm serious, baby. No, no, listen. All of them did records. I did entire genres. I don't like patting myself on the back, but uh, I, I honestly do think I did that. What the fuck is this? What is this? How do we make that sound? What is that? The original intent of the Roland TB303 bass line was to be an accompaniment to a piano or a keyboard player. In fact, they advertised it and promoted it with um, jazz musician and pianist Oscar Peterson. It shows him sitting there with the 303 and the 606, but it was never meant to record with. It was never meant to perform with. I remember we picked up one for like 40 bucks. When we got it, it just played straight. And I was like, hmm, this doesn't sound that interesting. I decided to just start turning the knobs to it just to see what, what that could do. And then next thing you know, it became a jam session. Spanky started programming hi-hats and claps and drum beats in the 707. And we were just jamming out for like a good hour straight and recorded it live. And we just looked at each other and said, wow, that was, that was crazy. And I remember saying, yeah, but who would play it? And Spanky said, only one person would play this, Ron Hardy. If you were from Chicago and you were making this new house music sound and you had a new record, Rodney would put it right on. Ron Hardy definitely influenced us to try different things in our music that we wouldn't normally try. What if I bring in the hi-hat right there and what if I do a crazy hi-hat that just goes and it has a flange on it? We would all, almost be like, man, would Ron like that? <laughs> So we went to the music box and told the bouncer or whatever what we wanted to do, and Ron let us come in. When he listened to the tape, we were looking for some type of emotion, but he just sat there thinking. Then he looked up, he said, when can I get a copy? 
And so he played it like really early in the night when he used to test out music. People kind of like just looked at each other and like, what is this? But then he played it four times. Man, they went crazy. Like bananas. This guy was on his back, kicking his legs up in the air. People were just going nuts. And it, and it, and it just, like an explosion, like. The effect of this record when Ron played it was crazy. When acid tracks began to permeate so many of the club tracks, it was really great. I mean, I thought like, oh, it's evolved. So-called house music was first made in the creators' houses, but it was also performed at clubs called The Warehouse and Powerhouse. However it got its name, it's one of the hottest things going, and as Jay Levine reports, it may only be a matter of time before house musicians become heroes in their own home. <laughs> They started playing house music at this Michigan Avenue hotel and health club last summer, and they've been packing them in ever since. It's the first time house has escaped the south side dance clubs or north side juice bars for a more upscale audience, though it's still a long way from sweeping the city. But in London, house has made it to the top of the pops faster than anything since the Beatles. I had no idea that house music had went overseas. I mean, to me, London was just a place on a map. Record Mirror came over and interviewed me, and I asked the guy, there's a lot of black people over there in the house music? And he was like, well, not, not really. He said, the scene is mostly Caucasian. And I was like, white people like house music? I did Move Your Body. The first time I brought it to the music box, Ron Hardy played it six times in a row. Sleazy, my friend, he gave Frankie Knuckles a copy of it. So Frankie started playing it, it really got big. Frankie Knuckles' best friend was Larry LeVan at the Paradise Garage in New York. Larry LeVan started playing it. Next thing I know, this guy from the UK starts calling me up. His name was Jazzy M. He was in London and he played on uh, this pirate radio station called LWR. Well, I'm thinking like, what the fuck, what, what's going on here? We went to the Berry Island Festival in Wales and I saw like 10,000 kids camping out and listening to music and that's when it really said you know this is a global thing people can understand it i was getting feedback from friends that were in london about what's this music what are these records they come on this red label with tracks on it it's a chicago house label someone is getting that message out to the rest of the world this is the hacienda you know it may not look much but it is the cathedral to house music in britain during the summer of 1988, I was studying in Manchester University and a friend said, let's go to the Hacienda, it's this kind of amazing club. We walked into the venue and it was like this level of energy that I had never witnessed before. The music was an outer-worldly, deconstructed, postmodern samples coming in and out. Many of us had never heard anything like this at the time. The music happens to coincide with the arrival of ecstasy in the United Kingdom, and that particular drug combined with this sound becomes a kind of explosion of house music uh, in the summer of 1988, the summer of love. I was excited and also angry at the same time. I never knew what was going on overseas until people came over and tried to interview me. And they were telling me what was going on. Larry Sherman, he realized that these tracks were going to be something, so he made sure that he had all the publishing from everybody on it so he could make deals. Larry Sherman's always tell me he only sold in New York, Chicago, and Detroit. We didn't have a clue about publishing and all of that kind of stuff. And then everybody realized that, um, you know, there was a lot going on that a lot of people didn't know about. Around that time, my new mayor got elected in Chicago, and he started cutting the parties off early, like making it where you couldn't go really late. And then the radio stations started changing their format at the same time, stopped playing house music on the radio. So the combination of those things kind of really led to me feeling like the life was just dying and getting sucked out of the scene. Look, we weren't musicians, man, you know? That's the end of the story right there. We weren't musicians, we weren't songwriters. We did what we did. You know, we did extremely good, 
for our talent level. But overall, I don't think we had the musical talent to progress to that next level. Other people took it to the next level, you know, briefly, but I don't think the songwriting was there. We were focused on the groove. We had great grooves, so. And uh, that's what we did. When House came in, they had that thing that we seemed to have lost. We got caught up in the, the commerciality of it. But people, they don't really care how you make it. They just want it to move them. The movement on the dance floor, it's a release for people. And that release is so primally important that people will take it in many different ways forms. Chicago has always been kind of a trendsetter when it comes to music, from jazz to blues to R&B to gospel, you name it. All we wanted to do was dance. So anything that would make you get up and shake your ass is what we would play. And that inspired people to want to go on and do their own tracks. House music was important because it showed the non-musician that he could make music. I think technology, it broadened the capability of what we could do <laughs> because we could really be experimental. I know that house is the basis for all these dance musics that are coming out now, all of them. I just believe house is the mother of them all. We made this stuff on nothing and look what it's done. Any movement takes a community of like-minded people to move it forward. We were competitive as DJs and producers, but we felt like we were in the same club, and we very much so wanted to do whatever we needed to do to help that club grow and spread as far as it can go.